Hello and welcome. I am Professor Rashmi Raman, as by now I am sure you have realized. And this is uh, module 32 of 36, you are nearing the end, of the paper International Criminal Justice and Politics. And we will be doing this through a case study of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Let us now look, as we always do, at what the learning outcomes are that are expected. First, I would like you to understand the regime of the Democratic Republic of Kampuchea in a portion entitled The Promise and the Price. Secondly, I would like you to understand what is meant by the new regime in Cambodia. Thirdly, the 1979 crisis and the response of the international community to Cambodia. And then the underpinnings of justice, a compromise, Caruso. Part 2 will deal with a culture of impunity, secondly a transitional justice approach and finally the question of problematizing the process of justice. A cornucopia of approaches has led to a deeper understanding of the elusive quest for fairness and justice in international criminal law. Among the most striking developments in the last few years since the inception of the International Criminal Court to end the reign of impunity and to bring perpetrators of grave crimes to justice has been the establishment of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia to try top level former Khmer Rouge leadership for crimes committed by their genocidal political outfit in the territory of democratic Kampuchea or the so-called DK, the precursor of the modern state of Cambodia. Based against a background of the proceedings of the court, of the court's first trial of comrade Doik, this module examines key issues in the development of a robust road to justice by the tribunal known as the ECCC. In the first part, the importance of creating the tribunal is borne out by a brief account of the crimes and the devastation wreaked by the Khmer Rouge during their reign, asserting the need to have some kind of justice in Cambodia and glancing at the political compromise that actuated the special agreement establishing the chambers. In the second part, we argue that a model of transitional justice is what is being sought to be achieved by these trials, a model that focuses on dealing with the past by having the truth told. In the third part, we predict the way ahead for this tribunal and we argue that a lot depends on what the judges make of this opportunity to redefine the traditional boundaries of international law and to encourage two areas where the tribunal may make its impact powerfully felt. Of these, the first is an expanding on the understanding of the crime of genocide in order to include crimes of the Khmer Rouge under it. Secondly, to tread warily on the possibility of admitting torture evidence against the tenets of the torture convention into evidence before the court. Analysis of the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia must begin with recounting in brief the horrors of the reign of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia from 1975 to 1979 putting into perspective anything that the present tribunal does in the context of the Khmer Rouge trials. Almost 45 years ago, Cambodia suffered one of the worst genocidal regimes of modern times. When the violently communist Khmer Rouge outfit overthrew the Khmer Republic 
of Lon Nol. The United States backed Lon Nol's administration, which in turn was a creature of the end of the rule of Narodom Sihanouk in 1970. Led by Pol Pot and his command lineup, the brutality of the Red Khmers lasted three years, eight months, and 20 days, not long enough to annihilate the entire population of the country and realize the fanatic agrarian utopia that Pol Pot originally set out to create, but long enough to wipe out a fifth of the population, leave, leave tens of thousands homeless, starved, diseased and maimed, or malnourished and severely retarded the developing of the nation as an independent state with no economic and political goals to achieve. Let us look at what was democratic Kampuchea in this section known as the promise and the prize. The ideological praxis behind the formation of democratic Kampuchea that was created as soon as the Khmer Rouge took over on April 17, 1975 was based on communist lessons borrowed from the neighboring states Vietnam, China and North Korea to reorganize society along agrarian lines and to demolish structures that to the Red Khmers symbolized feudalism and social inequity and oppression. The Khmer leader Pol Pot's communist coterie comprised a group of young scholars, most of whom were educated abroad at La Sorbonne in Paris, where they developed their idea of classless society and the idea of working in the fields to grow food and become self-sufficient to the point of fanaticism that it reached when it was implemented in democratic Kampuchea. The period witnessed the translation of the ideals of the select individuals whose brainchild the democratic Kampuchea was into the mindlessly brutal acts of several thousand individual soldiers whose position in the bottom rungs of the chain of command coupled with the fact of their ignorance, youth and illiteracy made their actions clearly genocidal, motivated by nothing greater than an unstoppable urge to kill and to torture, to punish and to persecute. A mass grave at the Khmer Rouge in 1979 and international responses to the crisis in Cambodia. The international community so deeply regrets its delay in recognizing the signs and intervening in the Rwandan genocide of 1994. But so little is written about the great failing of the international community to use force and intervene to try and stop the heinous genocide that was beeping red alert. What is most baffling is that there were press reports of the killings and the torture while it was occurring. There exists documented evidence of the torture chambers, such as Toll's Line. And yet, it took almost four years for Vietnam to send in troops and stop the Red Khmers. Supported later by China, the Khmer Rouge continued to put up a fight against UNTAC, that is the United Nations Transitional Administration in Cambodia, and the pro-liberation forces headed by Vietnam into the mid-80s. The new government set into position by the UNTAC under the leadership of a defector, the former Khmer Rouge leader Hun Sen, came into power in 1993 and has since sought to regain a sense of balance in administering the territory of Cambodia. The huge issue of adequately dealing with the atrocities committed during the period of democratic Kampuchea 
was forced into the background by more pressing issues of reviving the failing Cambodian economy, sustaining the population and putting the nation back on track. They were almost completely orphaned by the generation of Cambodians that were killed by the Khmer Rouge. And so the group of people that were left to rebuild were young children. No parents survived, no grandparents survived. The underpinnings of justice, a compromise carousel. It took until 1997, 20 years after the Red Khmers fled to the forests for Prime Minister Hun Sen and Prince Norodom Rana Riddha to seek, to seek United Nations assistance in creating a mechanism to hold those most accountable for the crimes that took place in democratic Kampuchea to trial. The United Nations responded by appointing a group of investigative experts under the auspices of the then Secretary General, which recommended that an international criminal tribunal be established for the express purpose of trying the Khmer Rouge leadership. A special agreement was then reached between the United Nations and the government of Cambodia over the next decade to combine United Nations as well as Cambodian resources into creating an extraordinary chambers in the existing criminal courts of Cambodia. Prince Norodom Ranarid was the architect of the design. The tribunal as it now exists came thus to be born of a great compromise between the international and national sides. Firstly, the structure of the court is such that it is a unique criminal tribunal. Unlike other international criminal tribunals, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia combine Cambodian national judges who make up the majority of the pre-trial chamber, the trials chamber, and the appeals chamber. While international judges are in the court, they are represented in smaller numbers. Additionally, one of each of the two co-investigating judges and co-investigating prosecutors has to be by law a Cambodian national. And the procedural law employed by the ECCC is Cambodian law, even though the agreement does provide for prior consultation of international procedural law for guidance in situations of uncertainty or conflict. Placing in this context the most important and most crippling controversy about the corruption and the sanctity of the tribunal as a court of law, it becomes increasingly apparent that any steps that this court will take in its course of existence will count a great deal towards the progressive development of law in the area of international criminal trials. These trials have generated a great deal of speculation over the last six years, ever since persistent doubts and questions about the transparency of the proceedings and corruption allegations came to be widely reported. As a result of charges of corruption levied at every level of the tribunal, from co-investigating judges to clerical staff, the corruption as yet unproven but still under investigation at both the administrative and judicial levels comes as the most crippling stumbling block in the short but widely publicized and colorful history of the Khmer Rouge trials. Just when, on the other hand, other hand, the funds allocated to the national side of the trial are fast depleting and raising funding to continue the trials has become a real problem. On the other hand, the first trial had started and the verdict came out. The whole world was watching as the tribunal ended what had come to be called a culture of impunity in the country. With the end of the first trial of Doik 
and the death of two others who were facing trial. The Cambodian tribunal has proved that despite severe impediments to its integrity, such as the claims of corruption, the age of the defendants, the delayed evidence, the difficulty in assessing the validity of evidence 40 years after the fact, and lack of support by the international community in assisting the hybrid procedural aspect of the trial, having seen to successful completion the trial of brother number one or Kaik Ek Guev, known as Doik, has shown that the Cambodia Tribunal continues the legacy of the International Criminal Court in ending a culture of impunity and assisting in the transitional justice end goal of allowing a community to come to terms with its past in order to be able to move on into its future. We will look at some features of the transitional justice aspect of this tribunal in the forthcoming module. Thank you.